corrected. We all learn something new every day. Um, but because those helictites are so rare and just odd looking, you'd think that in the 70s, when you see Berkeley sent the team of geologists in here to really research this cave system, that it'd be the first thing that they wanted to research and address, right? They immediately put it on the back burner. First thing they wanted to talk about, and I swear you've got the instinct for it because I keep aiming my flashlight at you, um, but this stalagmite here is actually one of the first things that they wanted to research and address. Because by looking at it, they're actually able to sort of secondhand witness a series of events that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. So this flowstone up here that looks like it's flowing out of the neighboring chamber, instead of forming over solid rock to create the lumpy texture that we've been seeing a lot, this would have formed over loose sand, gravel, and other loose debris, kind of flowing out all the way to that naturally heart-shaped hole in the rock. <laughs> and then all the way back over here, creating kind of a second story to this chamber. Now, on top of that false floor, this stalactite formation was creating that giant stalagmite mound at that level. But as water naturally washed away all of that debris, leaving the floor free hanging, it eventually became too heavy and it all came crashing down. So that's how that stalagmite ended up where it is. And that's why all these formations on the wall are scraped off. Any debris in this chamber is from that event. And you can actually see an outline of that natural false floor. Um, up there, there's like these kind of, looks like, those are kind of like roots, obviously they're not. But they're those are the helictites. Of, but they're like, you know, like a, you know, they're like in line. That line, yeah. So um, our helictites are constantly taking that path of least resistance. So in a lot of situations, even here, that's actually scraped off helictites. These would be as well. Um, those helictites take that path of least resistance to the point of finding natural cracks and following them rather than creating new ones. Okay, but these form that way out in the free air, right? By making, going... Yeah, so it's all forming out in the free air, but it's such a small drop at a time that right. it starts this way. So how'd they figure, out, figure that out? So something interesting is that actually when it gets clogged, the part of the, like, the theory that researchers still genuinely argue about today is yeah. why our helictites get clogged. Right. Because they're so rare, it's hard to find a common denominator between this cave, Timpanogos in Utah, Sonora in Texas. There's a blue cave in France where all their helictites come out naturally blue. All these helictites, because they're so different and in such different environments, they're having a really hard time finding the common denominator. So they know what the process looks like, but they don't know what instigates the clogging. Mm. That it, um, I had somebody propose a theory that it could just be the introduction of iron and other impurities, right. but iron is such a common sediment that I would expect other variables to have to be involved for that to be the case. I just want to 